Hello, and welcome to our series, Conversations on Zionism, Reclaiming the Narrative. I'm Russell Robinson, Chief Executive Officer of Jewish National Fund USA. The time has come to be the voice of what Zionism really is. We're exposing the beautiful and diverse facets and facts of Zionism. Join me on this journey, together with Conversations on Zionism, Reclaiming the Narrative. This is Zionism. Thanks for joining us uh, for part two of our panel discussion, Young Jews Talk Justice. I want to encourage all of you to go to jnf.org slash convos to learn more about this year long series and listen to panel discussions with experts and incredible people. Uh, my name is Chen Mazig, I'm an Israeli writer and I'm a senior fellow at the Tel Aviv Institute. Uh, and I would just want to briefly introduce our uh, panelist again, Isabella Khazan, uh, joining us from uh, Montreal, uh, a Middle East conflict resolution and people diplomacy, among many other accomplishments. Uh, Isabella founded uh, uh, Humans for Humanity. Um, she's also a law student in, uh, in Montreal um, and just an incredible voice online. Um, we also have Noach, Noach Shaputinsky, um, also known by his stage name, Westside Gravy, uh, fuses his passion for Jewish culture and history with his lived experience of growing up Black and Jewish across the U.S. to write and produce hip hop. Um, thanks for joining us, Noach. And we have Amy Albertson, uh, the Asian American Jewish Israeli from California, who while living in Israel for six years, created a brand, the Asian Israeli, where she discussed her mixed identities and experiences as a Chinese American Jewish woman. Thank you for joining us uh, again. Um, and I'm really excited to continue in the conversation where we stopped. Isabella, I want to shift a bit to a different uh, topic that you know a lot of, and that's where we met for the first time was uh, on college campuses. Um, what is the most important thing young Jews on college campuses need to know about Zionism? And why do you think, um, what are the challenges that they're going to, uh, to face now that they're getting to, um, to campuses? Is BDS, the boycott movement on campuses, a real threat or is it just um, a movement that we're hearing about but doesn't have any, um, any teeth? So the anti-Semitic BDS movement is definitely not a threat to Israel as Israel's economy has only grown. If anything, it is just speaks to um, the traditional anti-Semitism, anti -Semitism, which is push, pushing Jews out of any space, whether it's progressive or now it's on campus. In my opinion, the biggest challenge that Jews on campus, and I would feel young Jews face, especially in North America, that's the experience I could speak to, is being subject to the good Jew test. And what is a good Jew? A good Jew in their eyes is a Jew who rejects their Jewish identity, or at least an integral part of it being Israel. Israel is in our DNA, it's in our culture. Jerusalem, Zion is where we pray towards. So being a good, good Jew is essentially renouncing being a Jew, in my opinion. And I think that is the biggest challenge that Jewish students face because it's a, it's a barrier to entry in order to be accepted. And that often goes with Zionism, a part that, you know, as Noah mentioned, over 96% of Jews are Zionists. And we're not going to stop being who we are in order to please the non-Jewish world and to enter spaces that we have the right to be in. Um, I think that would be the greatest challenge. And uh, apropos to the anti-Semitic BDS movement, it definitely has no effect on Israel. The startup nation's economy is absolutely flourishing. Um, so their supposed um, goal has clearly failed. But their greater goal is to make Israel into a pariah, pariah state and to isolate Israel. And that's the exact same thing that they're doing to Jews on campus, or at least attempting to, but we will not take that. We're empowered ideologically. And that is the biggest challenge, is that they're trying to push Jews out of spaces that we belong in and trying to make us renounce our identity and also based in misinformation. Zionism is not about Palestinians. Zionism is about Jews. That's it. That's all. And when we say that Zionism is about anything else, it ignores British imperial powers and also ignores the consequences of war, which are very much there. And at the end, it just blames the Jew, which is something that we all know just painted differently every, every generation. 
That's such an important point. And I think, you know, people are saying, well, I'm an anti-Zionist because I'm critical of the Israeli government. It doesn't work this way. If you're an anti-Zionist, you're not critical of Israel. You don't want Israel to exist. You want the Jewish state to die. And that's an important distinction between criticism, which, you know, if you support Israel's existence, then you can criticize it. If you don't support Israel's existence, what are you criticizing? You're criticizing the fact that my family is alive and the families of of many uh, Jews in Israel is alive. So um, that's an important distinction uh, to make. I want to go to you, Amy, uh, again. Um, where do you think the Jewish community can improve the way that we're advocating for Zionism? We spoke about indigenous rights. We spoke about uh, our connection to the land. We spoke about how we uh, we cannot um, allow people to tell us that there's good Jews and bad Jews. By the way, there's no good Jews and bad Jews. There's just Jews that hate gefilte fish and those that love gefilte fish. Uh, that's what I think. Um, but <laughs> and I don't like it personally. But what do you think, uh, Amy, is the way to uh, to improve uh, uh, how we to discuss Zionism? Um, I mean, I'll start with I also don't like gefilte fish. But um, I mean, I think it's it's what we've just been saying. It's a lot about and Isabella kind of talked about this as not separating our Jewishness. And I think Noah also mentioned it in one of his early responses is it's really just being unapologetic and teaching, teaching young Jews that you can be in those spaces. You have the right to be in those spaces. And in fact, it's a value to those spaces in addition to yourself to be unapologetically Jewish and Zionist. I think, um, I think, a lot of our activism, and I'm also guilty of this, is it comes as a response to crisis, right? Um, As much as I'm really happy about the number of new social media accounts or vocal young Jewish voices I've seen pop up on social media in response to the last escalation in Gaza, that's out of a response of crisis. And I think it has to be very grassroots, very foundational to just your being from, you know, always. Um, I think one big part of that is is part of accepting all different types of Jews and learning about different types of Jews in our community. Because if you're not accepted by your own community, how are you going to be proud to go out and tell someone else, yeah, I'm Jewish and you can't tell me I'm not. Um, so I think that's one really big thing is, is this uh, accepting different types of Jews, learning about different types of Jews, and then going out there and being unapologetic and educating the outside world about who the Jewish people are and um, and putting our foot down. Of course, one of the big challenges of this is that now, unfortunately, I mean, it always has been, but it's especially, it can be dangerous. Um, you know, on campus, um, you can literally be physically assaulted. That is also a concern and I understand people's fear, but I think we really just have to stay strong. That's a, a, an important point, and I think it's one that you live by. I remember that the days in Portland State University mm-hmm. where uh, Amy was standing in front of a group of uh, anti-Israel uh, students that wanted to kick her out of a room, but she, uh, as they had a lecture there, and, and you just didn't want it to do it. You said you're not going to go. I, I was with you there, uh, and I've seen a brave Jewish woman that uh, wasn't afraid, and do you remember that, uh, Amy? Uh, yes, Ken, I do remember that. It was a BDS conference on my campus. This was one of our first adventures into activism together back in the day. And uh, they pl- they pl- had a BDS conference on campus, a public university campus. I went to Portland State University. And they tried to tell me, you're anti-BDS, so you can't be here. And I said, I am a student just like everyone else. I pay student fees and I'm helping sponsor this. So if you want to hold your BDS conference on a public university campus where I'm allowed to be, 
I'm going to be here. And they ended up canceling that part of the conference where they were planning their strategy and they went to someone's private home. And um, yeah, but no, I would not be pushed out because I have every right to be there. And I think that's something that young Jewish students, as scary as it can be, like, just do it. Just stand your ground because you have that right. Amen. Amen. I'm totally here for that. And that's exactly what we're talking about. Don't let them push you out. You have every right to be there, not only because you paid for uh, for campus, uh, for, for, your, for your studies, but you have a right to be there. We all need to be inside. We're not going to allow anyone to push us out of, the, of any conversation that we want to be a part of. Um, and uh, another uh, incredible speech that I remember hearing on college campuses came from Noah a few years ago um, in one of the BDS resolutions. I remember um, it went viral and everyone were watching it and loving everything you said there. Um, and I remember hearing some pain in your, uh, in your speech about how um, other minority communities on campus uh, have shunned the Jewish community or just uh, abandoned us. Um, is that something that you see now on campus as you went to George Washington University? Um, did you did you see it on campus? Do you think it's something that is happening? And 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 if not, I mean, what is the situation? Yeah, so I think uh, more so what the issue is, is you have people who aren't even necessarily part of any minority communities trying to take advantage of different issues that are going on and use them for their own political agenda to create that whole divide and conquer uh, climate. Um, so specifically, like during that speech, what I was speaking about was the fact that someone who wasn't black and I don't believe was Jewish either uh, was trying to actually, you know, weaponize anti-black racism, make it out to be that Israel's responsible for it in the United States. And when I called him on that, he literally said, oh, we don't really talk about anti-black racism unless we're talking about it in Israel because it's not convenient to, your, to, to our narrative. Obviously, is already offended at this anti-Semite. On top of that, I'm offended at the fact that you think the experience of my people, the oppression of my people in the United States is something you can just whip out so you can throw hate against Israel, that you have no relation to it and you're not even black. So for me, that that's really what created that sort of pain. And I think we're seeing a lot of that. And I think that in general, you know, a lot of young American Jews are, are doing a great job at supporting other communities, um, if I'm going to be general about it. I think that when you look at like, what are issues with it right now, and you look at like sort of that support that uh, you spoke about, that maybe seems like it's going backwards. Part of me thinks that that's not a response of a lack of American Jews, um, you know, supporting other communities. I think more so uh, it's a fact that we're not being strong enough to counter that narrative and to point out the fact that people are trying to take other issues and, and make it as if us as Jewish people um, and people connected to Israel are responsible for them. And I think, you know, on a personal level, if you're looking at like a personal experience of someone, what happens is you get so many people who are Jewish and they want to be involved in movements for justice for other communities. And they get involved and they sort of get the feeling that, you know, and it comes from a good place of not wanting to center yourself uh, in an issue. I think it comes from a good place. Um, so they don't necessarily bring their Judaism or their Zionism to the forefront of those issues, which they don't necessarily have to. And then at the same time, it gets worse because when, you know, there's a climate already that's biased against Israel and people start asking you, hey, like, what do you think about Israel? A lot of times people's response is, oh, like, I don't support everything the Israeli government does. Oh, like, I'm, I'm Jewish and, you know, but I, I'm not really like affiliating with a certain particular movement and kind of stays out of it. And I think that just furthers the expectation that Jewish people, in order to support these movements, have to be people who hide those parts of their identities. And I was on campus for a long time and, and when it, I was involved in all kinds of different events. And I think I also learned this from my music. People appreciate authenticity. So I have people who are not Jewish or not black and will listen to my like fun West Coast songs. And then when they come across a conscious song, they'll say, I appreciate this because you're being authentic and you're being genuine. And this is a story I haven't heard before. And I think if we want people to actually show us support back, it shouldn't be like a natural expectation that I show up for you and check my identity. You're going to show up for me and check what you perceive is like your identity that doesn't affiliate with this. I think that we need to be authentic in our interactions and the people who see that will stand with us and the people who don't stand with us usually are, are racist. There's no better gift to give or receive than one that can connect you with nature and your homeland. JNF has made it super easy for you to order your tree certificate online. Just go to jnf.org slash trees Pick which special occasion it's for, whether a birth, bar mitzvah. Just order your tree online and let's get planting. 
every tree counts. As a memorial to a loved one, as a tribute for a special occasion, as a link to your heritage, as a link to the land of Israel, to help the environment and reduce your carbon footprint. Every tree counts. Isabella, I want to go back to you. Um, we spoke about the connection to Israel, but I want to know um, the connection of Jews to Israel. That is, I wanted to know what makes you the most connected to Israel. I, I often say that being uh, Jewish and alive is, is a miracle in and of itself, but I want to know for you, um, what is your, uh, your connection, where it comes from, and maybe something that can inspire our young Jewish uh, viewers. Somebody who has really always inspired me um, with regards to Judaism and Israel is my grandmother, Elise. She came from Morocco to Montreal with really nothing. She was really an empowered Jewish woman. Before her time, she started all the businesses that my family you know, now has. She was really spearheading everything. Super, super strong, unapologetic Zionist, of course. Um, I don't even think it was a thing to not be Zionist at those times. Or if it was, it was definitely not common. And it was just outright weird as it is today still. And um she would always tell me that when she was younger, um, in Morocco, they would say, Palestine, which means next year in Palestine. And by that, she meant the British mandate of Palestine. And my connection to Israel is one that's not specific to something today. It's not Shalat, it's not Gordon, it's the land. And it's every morning I pray, <laughs> I pray towards Jerusalem. And it's something that's been passed down from generation to generation. It's ancient traditions that we have and that we, we keep alive. And I think that's really what's beautiful about um, you know, Jewish identity across, you know, across the diaspora. I recently went to many Jewish weddings, including my sister's. And um, as I saw my, my sister's husband, Khatan, breaking the glass, I thought every Jewish wedding has so many different customs. My sister had a henna. But no matter the wedding, every groom will break the glass to remember the destruction of Jerusalem. And that's a universal tradition and feeling that we have connected to Israel, whether it's my grandmother who says, or you know, a Jew in Eastern Europe, it's something that is passed down. And to me, it's, uh, it's that also that Jewish pride. It's one of the reasons I started keeping kosher was because Jews had the choice to die or, or to eat kosher. And I said, wow, it's so easy to eat kosher today. How can I not? It started off for Jewish pride reasons. So um, that would probably be my connection is to, you know, remain being pride and uh, to have pride in who we are and especially where we come from and we come from Israel. I love that. And I'm sure your uh, your grandmother and your mother, I know she, for sure, is part of you and your work. Um, and it's uh, it's really interesting. It's the same connection to me with my mother and my grandmother, my grand my grandparents that um, that really inspires a lot of what I'm doing, because I know that, you know, they're they survived because of uh because of Israel, but also because of the connection that they have. And, and I think, you know, you mentioned how we always remember Jerusalem. And that's another point that a good friend of mine, she's a Native American Jewish woman, Marina Shij, and she always says that as long as you maintain this connection to a land, you keep your indigenous status. So you're an indigenous person as long as you have the connection to the land. And us as Jews, we pray to Jerusalem three times a, a day. We're, uh, you know, we're breaking the glass and remembering Jerusalem. Uh, we have very indigenous costumes that we don't even realize how, uh, how you know, how indigenous people uh, it is to to welcome the, the spirits or the angels of peace into our house on Friday or uh, waving the, the species, the, the, the vegetables to six directions of the wind in um, in Sukkot, all of this is very much indigenous people. That's what makes us indigenous people. And once people remove Israel or remove Jerusalem uh, from their prayers or uh, don't want to maintain this connection, then they lose their indigenous status. So yes, you can lose your indigenous status. It's not where your grandparents came from, but uh, as long as you maintain the connection to where you started as people, um, that makes you an indigenous person. So I think that's also an important point to, to point out. Um, Amy, I want to ask you the same question. I mean, what is your connection to to, to Israel, what is your family story? If if it if it has inspired you uh, to be a Zionist and activist as you are today, um, I think my connection to Israel is is I you know I honestly didn't grow up with such a such a you know Jewish um, upbringing or Zionist. I of course did know Israel existed and it was the Jewish state, but I didn't know it was controversial. Um, anything like this. And for me, Israel was one of the first places where I felt truly Jewish because um, as I started to go into more Jewish spaces as a young adult, 
Uh, there's a lot of questions. How are you Jewish? Are you sure? Oh, only your dad is Jewish. Do you pray? Do you know all the, the brachot? Do you go to synagogue? Do you do these things? And and I didn't grow up doing those things partially from because I came from a mixed family and partially because my grandmother, um, God bless her, is just a very um, different alternative type of woman, but she's very pr- she's a proud Jew. And that was always something. So um, for me, going to Israel, I really... I really loved it because it's a place where you don't have to do Jewish to be Jewish. In diaspora, often we always feel the need, and I understand it completely, that we need to do Jewish things to be Jewish. But existing is being Jewish um, to an extent. And in Israel, you just exist. Shabbat will come whether you want it to or not. The high holidays are going to be the high holidays whether you want it to or not. Um, You know, Kosher food, you're going to find it, whether you're looking for it or not. And for me, that was just such an eye-opening experience that I didn't need to feel inadequate because I was just being Jewish with Jewish people. Isabella and Chen, you talk about being inspired by your grandmothers who were these um, very different Jewish grandmothers than mine. But at the end of the day, even though my grandmother, you know, she lives in Berkeley and she's She's very much on paper one of these maybe progressive liberal people that might reject Zionism. She doesn't. She understands the need for Israel. She's always, you know, talks to me about how important it is. And and she's a proud Jewish woman despite any of that. And I think that's just it's a really important example for me um, as a young Jewish person seeing a lot of progressive spaces rejecting us. But um, to go back to your point about Israel and my connection is definitely it's just it's, it was the first place that I felt kind of accepted and like I was being a Jew. That's, that's uh, amazing. And that's, that has been the dream of uh, the early Zionists and uh, Jabotinsky was uh, uh, a secular Jewish uh, uh, thought leader in his time that uh, kept Shabbat, that kept all the religious customs because he understood that he has to keep it for his identity. And only when he moved, when after Israel, he says that in Israel, we will be able to have a secular Jewish identity, um, which I share with you. And I, and I completely connect to, um, to this point, especially after I moved to the UK and I'm all of a sudden keeping kosher and keeping Shabbat and doing everything I can to, uh, to keep my identity because it feels like it's almost diluted. And, and in Israel, there's this acceptance. And I think this acceptance is really the key to everyone are talking today about how we keep Judaism and how Judaism will survive. Judaism will survive when we accept everyone and when we don't you know, challenge people for their Jewish identity or if they're Jewish, because that's, um, first of all, it's not, uh, it's the most non-kosher thing you can do, um, but also it's, uh, it's, it's wrong for the continuing uh, of our of our community and our story. Are you looking for that perfect gift? The one thing you know that they won't have? Now you can honor someone you love and participate in the sacred act of writing a Torah. You can go online and choose a letter, word, verse, or more in a Torah being written right here in Israel on top of Masada. A beautiful certificate will be sent signifying the link to our ancient past and be something that they can keep forever. It's the ideal gift for birth, bar and bat mitzvahs, birthdays, engagements, weddings, anniversaries, and other milestones in life. No, I want to go uh, to you. Um, what do you? Uh, what is your connection to to Israel? Where that? Where is that coming from? So first, I just want to say I really what you said really resonates with me, uh, Amy, and also Chen, and. I also have had a similar experience of being in Israel and connecting with certain customs for me. It's not, it doesn't feel like, oh, like I need to do it to be like accepted by this Jewish community. And also on the flip side, I don't need to do it in spite of like anti-Semites needing to show that I'm Jewish. It's just, if I choose to wear a kippah, it's because I want to wear a kippah and I'm feeling that spiritual connection. And I think that's something that's really special and unique about being here uh, from a personal perspective. And, and the other thing is about like getting those questions constantly. Uh, how are you Jewish? Sort of made to feel like you're not welcome. Um, and when I get here and I go to places and people are curious about everyone's background, it doesn't matter if like they look Jewish or don't look Jewish. That's not a thing that I've experienced. People want to know. Um, and they'll ask me questions about where you, like, what's your background? And I tell them, they're like, no, where, like, where's your family from? From like, uh, what background are you? And I answer them. And the response isn't really, how are you Jewish? The response is, wow, that's such a cool mix. Tell your whole family to come home. And that is something that really like positively impacted me. Um, and has built my own personal connection. But I think where it all really started 
uh, was in my household, growing up in a Black American household, uh, Soviet Russian household, uh, and also you know a, a Jewish household. Um, the idea of having a homeland has been stripped from my family for generations. So I feel like I'd be damned if I don't take advantage of the opportunities that my parents sacrificed to give me uh, to be able to connect to my culture and my heritage and my people. Um, if I don't take advantage of those and pay it forward so my kids one day can take it even further. Uh, and it really hit me this past Pesach, sitting around the table, thinking about just one generation ago, when my, in the, where my dad was born in Moscow in the Soviet Union, it would have been illegal for us to, to, to say the prayers that we did. Kosher food, all this food on the table wouldn't have been accessible. Even the matzah that many uh, Soviet Jews, Jews from across the former Soviet Union, uh, hold like so dear on Passover because it was one of the few things you could get was not kosher for Passover, but they still did it to keep that connection. And the fact that there's so many people from that same background who came here to Israel and are, are figuring out their connection, but it shows that Israel, as Ken, you mentioned, Israel was like a lifeline. Uh, in many cases, physically for so many people, but also for people from uh, former Soviet countries, it was a spiritual lifeline. It was an ideological lifeline. It was a way to say, even if we're not able to go pray, even if we it's illegal for us and we get arrested for saying we want to return to Israel, we're still going to hold that in our hearts. Even if we aren't keeping kosher because our religion is banned and it's illegal, we're still going to hold Israel in our hearts. And one day we're going to be able to go back. And at the end of the Seder, being able to say the Shana Habab Yerushalayim, and know that that is realistically going to happen. Like that realistically is something that's accessible for us. I think that really like uh, is where my roots, my the roots of the connection that I feel to Israel come from. What a point to to end on. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, if I take anything from this panel is really that um, I am much more hopeful about uh, the future uh, leaders of the Jewish community with you three and many like you out there um, that are doing this important work. I want to thank you for uh, everything you're doing. I want to encourage our viewers to follow you on social media. I know you all are on Twitter and on Instagram um, and continue the conversation online. Um, tag us, tag, tag JNF USA as well. Um, and just remember that there's no more admirable cause to support than um, the story of the Jewish people that is now being maintained and continue uh, in, in Israel um, and continuing it all over the world. I want to thank you for joining us and uh, stay in touch. <laughs>